Hi, boys and girls. This is Dr. Clay. I'm excited to join you um, to read this wonderful book to you today. Um, I first want to say just how much I miss you, and I hope that you're all doing well and continuing to keep up with your academics and the work that your teachers are providing right now. Uh, I'm excited to read this book to you today. The title is The Girl from the Tar Paper School, Barbara Rose Jones, and the Advent of the Civil Rights Movement. So this book is a true story. So how many of you out there can tell me if it's a true story what the genre is? And hopefully you said nonfiction. So it is a true story about her life, but she did not write the story. Someone else wrote the story. So if the genre is nonfiction, what's, what is the specific type of book that this is? If someone else wrote it about her life. It is a biography. Very good. So another thing that excites me about reading this to you is that her story took place in a place called Prince Edward, Virginia, Farmville, Virginia, which was about 25 minutes from where I grew up. So I used to go to Farmville a lot. So I know um, maybe not during the time period that this was happening, but I know where that town is. So that just makes it a little more exciting. It's always good to kind of know our history and know things that have happened in the past and things that have brought us to where we are today. So this is a longer story. It's not a short read aloud. Um, so you may want to pause the video at certain points if you need to. Um, but let's begin reading. All right, the tar paper shack problem. The year was 1950. Barbara Rose Johns was a 15-year-old high school junior with a problem to solve. Barbara and her sister Joan attended the Robert R. Moton High School for Black Students, located in the nearest town, Farmville, Virginia, 15 miles from their farm. Her brothers, Ernest and Roderick, attended the Mary Branch Elementary School, also in Farmville. Moton High was a squat brick building nestled in a fork of Route 15. Alongside the school were temporary classrooms built to accommodate an overflow of students. The structures were made of wood and covered with a heavy paper coated with tar. The students called them chicken coops. The tar paper shacks were Barbara's problem. They didn't appear to be temporary. When it rained, the roofs leaked. Buckets collected the dripping water. Some students sat under umbrellas so the ink on their papers wouldn't run. The makeshift classrooms, like the regular classrooms, were heated by potbelly wood stoves. Instead of furnaces. So I want you all to think about that for a minute. Um, what they're describing here is the school that she went to that leaked when it rained, um, that actually had tar paper covering the building. I want you to imagine that and think about the kind of schools that we go to today. What a big difference that was and why that was a problem for Barbara. Students sitting near the stoves were too hot. Students sitting farther away from the stoves shivered in their coats, hats, scarves, and gloves. As a result, they frequently got sick. Teachers had to stop their lessons to stoke the fire. Smoke often eddied into the room instead of going up the chimney, causing sneezing and watery eyes. One day, Barbara spoke to her favorite teacher, Miss Inez Davenport, about the problem of the shacks. Miss Davenport taught music at the high school. Barbara had come to know her on a personal level when she and Joan took piano lessons from her. Barbara had grown to trust her feeling she could share her private thoughts with Miss Davenport without Miss Davenport thinking her childish. I'm sick and tired of it all, Barbara told her. Barbara talked about Moton's inadequacies and Farmville High's superior facilities. Farmville High, the school for white students, had modern heating, an industrial art shop, locker rooms, an infirmary, a cafeteria, and a real auditorium complete with sound equipment. When Barbara finished speaking, she looked to Miss Davenport for an answer. But Miss Davenport was the type of teacher who encouraged her students to think for themselves. She believed life was like music, varied and rich, lending itself to different moods, moments, thoughts, and opinions. 
So instead of offering a solution, Ms. Davenport asked a question. Why don't you do something about it? Barbara turned away, disappointed. At the time, she didn't understand the importance of the question. She felt Miss Davenport had dismissed her with that reply. And over here, you'll see some pictures. Um, this is Farmville High School, which is the nicer high school that the story speaks of. Um, and then in this picture, it's to the sides of the picture, which is over here. Um, there are the shacks that they're speaking of um, that Barbara and her siblings attended. A little child shall lead them. Over the next few days, Barbara spent time in the woods near her home in Darlington Heights, contemplating the problem of the tar paper shacks. The Jones's house, perched atop a slight hill, was a wood frame structure painted white with black trim. A porch wrapped around the front. Barbara's favorite place to think was a secluded spot down the hill from the house where the woods grew thick, the underbrush dense. Sitting on the stump while her horse, Saddy Red, grazed or drank from the nearby creek, she thought about the tar paper classrooms. As Barbara pondered the problem, her imagination ran wild, and she dreamed that a mighty man of great wealth would build the black students of Prince Edward County a new school. She even imagined the celebration that would follow. Other times, she imagined a great storm flattening the tar paper shacks and a new building arising magically from the wreckage. She thought about the problem as she went about her chores, chopping wood and feeding the pigs. She prayed. God, please grant us a new school. Please let us have a warm place to stay where we won't have to keep our coats on all day. Please help us. We are your children too. Barbara's father, this is Barbara's father right here. Robert Melvin Johns, a farmer, worked long hours in the field growing corn, soybeans, watermelons, sunflowers, and tobacco. Tobacco was his main cash crop. In 1950, however, a small tobacco farm didn't bring in much money. To help make ends meet, Barbara's mother, Violet Adele Johns, worked full-time as a clerk in the Navy Department in Washington, D.C., more than 165 miles away to the northeast. Can you imagine that? Her mom worked 165 miles away from where they lived. During the work week, while their mother was gone, Barbara was in charge of her younger siblings and the household task. She rose early to help everyone get ready for school. She cleaned, cooked, and made sure all the chores were done. One morning in October, she was so busy, busy rushing her brothers and sisters down the hill to wait for the bus that she forgot her lunch and had to run back to the house to retrieve it. In the meantime, the old bus arrived and picked up her siblings, leaving her behind. There was nothing to do but wait for someone to come along who might give her a ride. Her family lived in the Darlington Heights region, 15 miles south of Farmville, an area consisting mostly of forests, low rolling hills, and farmland. In that part of Virginia, you could wait a long time for a car to drive by. An hour later, she was still waiting. Down the road, she saw the school bus for the white children approaching, shiny and new and, and half empty on its way to Farmville High. The bus would pass Moton High, but Barbara couldn't ride it. The bus went right by her, but of course didn't stop. The injustice stung. Right then and there, Barbara later said, I decided something had to be done about this inequality but I still didn't know what to do. And this is a picture uh, of some cheerleaders from her high school right here. Barbara knew that Moton's High, Moton High's principal and Parent Teacher Association had been working for years to convince the all-white school board to allocate money to build a new school for black students. There had been endless delays, one excuse after another, and a true bureauc bureaucratic runaround. She suspected that the school board and town officials left to themselves would never actually build a new school, even though the law required separate facilities to be equal. A plan took shape. 
Her idea was to assemble the Moton High class leaders, those she considered the creme de la creme, and with them lead a strike to protest the unfair conditions at their school. Barbara would give a speech to inspire her classmates. They would carry signs and march in front of the school. Their strike would draw the attention of citizens of Farmville and beyond. People would hear them and sympathize. With students refusing to attend substandard school, the school board, superintendent, and leaders of Farmville would have no choice but to grant the black students a new building. The next morning, she arose, refreshed and energized, ready to put her plan into action, confident that events would unfold as she'd imagined. After all, didn't the Bible say that the wolf shall dwell with the lamb and a little child shall lead them? So she has a plan. Let's see what happens. The quiet embrace of the woods. Barbara's family had lived in Prince Edward County for generations. All four of her grandparents were born there. Her mother's family, the Spencers, and her father's family, the Joneses, attended the same Baptist church, Triumph. Shortly after Barbara's parents were married, they moved to New York City in search of work, living in a Harlem rooming house with some of her mother's relatives. Her father did odd jobs, and her mother worked as a domestic servant. Barbara was born in New York City on March 6, 1935. When she was 14 months old, her parents gave up trying to scrape together a living in New York and returned to Prince Edward County. They moved into some rooms behind a store belonging to Barbara's uncle, Vernon, and her father's older, her father's older brother. The store had a gas pump and a mill. On the mill was a sign, leave your corn as you go to town. When you return, it will be ground. And another, we grind corn as fine as flour. Barbara's parents tended the store and the mill and pumped gasoline, but the store wasn't able to support their growing family. By then, Barbara's sister Joan and the oldest of her brothers, Ernest, had been born. So in 1942, Barbara's family moved to Washington, D.C., where they lived in an apartment not far from the Capitol building. Mrs. Johns found steady clerical work and Mr. Johns took on odd jobs. And this is the store that they're speaking of. When World War II broke out, Mr. Johns was drafted into the army. The resulting financial strain forced Barbara's mother to take her children back to Prince Edward County to live with her mother, Mary Spencer Croner, now remarried for the remainder of the war. Barbara, then seven years old, thoroughly enjoyed the train ride to Virginia, particularly because the car was full of soldiers dressed smartly in their crisp uniforms. She explained later, the ride on the train had been exciting, mainly because it was my first train ride. But mostly because it was crowded with soldiers, I was fascinated by all of them. They were tall men who looked so handsome and polished in their uniforms. I was particularly impressed by them because my own daddy had been called into the army. And though I had not seen him in his uniform, I imagined he must look as handsome as all these men. So this picture right here is Barbara's parents, her dad and her mom. After the children were settled on their grandmother's farm, Mrs. Johns returned to Washington, D.C. to live with her sister and work in the city. Mary Croner and her second husband were patient, sturdy, hardworking farmers. Barbara adjusted readily to the routine of the farm. She seldom got the chance to sit down before hearing her grandmother call, Barbie, her grandmother's pet name for her. Barbara would run to feed the chickens or go gather the eggs or pick up chips of wood for the stove or fetch a bucket of fresh water from the spring. Whatever chore was needed. Are y'all doing chores right now? I wonder. Think about all the chores that she had to do. Mary Croner approved of her serious and hardworking granddaughter. She didn't have a lot of put-ons or airs about her, Mary said. She was a country girl, not some flirty thing worrying about clothes. Barbara enrolled in a one-room school, which also served as a Sunday school, set in a patch of pine not far from her grandmother's home. First through seven grades, seventh grades were taught in the single room. So I want you to hear that. In the school she enrolled in as a young girl, all in one room were first grade through seventh grade. Can you imagine that? 
After elementary school, students went to the high school. In school and at home, Barbara thrived. She later remembered those years as happy ones. Sometimes at night, Barbara and Joan slipped out of bed and listened at the door while the adults talked of the old days. They heard about life during slave times and recent lynchings. These stories frightened Joan and convinced her she'd be killed if she angered a white person, but they raised Barbara's fighting spirit. When Mr. Johns returned home on temporary leave from the army, he moved his children to the home of his mother, Sally Johns. Sally didn't farm and she lived in the smaller house. So there were fewer chores and more time for reading and writing and studying. Sally Johns was an intelligent, outspoken woman who admired those traits in others. She argued good-naturedly, but nevertheless, she argued about everything from when the war would end to how much sugar a person should put in a cup of coffee. What impressed Barbara about her grandmother was her fearlessness. Sally Johns was not the slightest bit subservient to whites. Barbara's Uncle Vernon was the most spirited and dynamic member of the Johns family, perhaps one of the most spirited and perplexing citizens in Prince Edward County's history. Hailed as brilliant and a dangerous firebrand, Reverend Vernon Johns was an ordained Baptist minister educated at Virginia Union in Richmond. Oberlin College in Ohio, and Virginia Theological Seminary in Lynchburg. His method was to shock and anger. For example, one of his sermons was titled, It is Safe to Murder Negroes. He offended blacks when he chided them for docility and ignorance. He offended whites when he denounced lynching as immoral. Barbara thought he towered in intellectually over the entire county, black and white. And this is a picture of her uncle, Vernon Johns. Now, some of you may have heard of Vernon Johns, uh, I believe it's middle school that is in Petersburg. So that school was named after her uncle, Vernon Johns. During those years, Vernon's wife, Altona, another music teacher at Moton High, and their children were also living in the same home of Sally Johns. Reverend Johns was in and out, often gone for months at a time, lecturing at colleges and giving sermons. When he was home, he preached locally and wrote for various periodicals. Reverend Johns made sure his children and his nieces and nephews read the serious and weighty books he kept in the house. He quizzed them regularly, particularly about black history. He required the children to read the encyclopedia starting with A and working their way to Z. A to Z encyclopedia, that's a lot of reading, boys and girls. Barbara, an avid reader, eagerly read each book, as such books as The Postman Always Rings Twice and The War of the Worlds and denser volumes such as Up from Slavery and Native Son. However, she didn't care for her uncle's imposed reading, so sometimes while she was supposed to be reading the encyclopedia, she inserted Betty and Veronica comic books, and there's a picture of that right there, in between the pages and read those instead. She was trying to trick her uncle into thinking she was reading the encyclopedia. World War II ended when Barbara was 10. Her father returned from Europe, and her mother came home from Washington. Reverend Johns, at about this time, moved his own family to Montgomery, Alabama, where he became pastor of the Dexter Avenue Baptist Church. While Barbara's father built a new house and barn, the family went back to living in the rooms behind Reverend John's store. In the living room behind the store, the fireplace was flanked by two bookcases reaching to the ceiling filled with books. Barbara, her siblings, and her parents spent pleasant evenings reading by the fire. During the day, they pumped gasoline, tended to the mill, and waited on customers in the store. The store was frequent, frequented by blacks and whites. One white girl often came into the store with her father. She and Barbara sat together and talked, and Barbara thought her beautiful. One day, Barbara saw the girl in the five and ten cent store in Farmville and greeted her, but the girl coolly turned away. Barbara seed, seed, fully aware she'd been snubbed because of her race. Barbara was also irritated when white customers called her father Uncle Robert. 
Once she spoke up and said, Why are you calling him uncle? He is not your uncle. Her words shocked her sister and elders. Barbara had been raised to be respectful to all adults, and in the 1950s in rural Virginia, black children simply did not speak to whites that way. Family members observed with pride and apprehension that Barbara seemed to be taking after her uncle Vernon. When the Joneses' new family home in Darlington Heights was finished, with much excitement, Barbara, her parents, and her siblings moved in. The boys shared a first floor bedroom across from their parents' room. Barbara and Joan shared a second floor attic room and a full size bed. Sometimes after they were supposed to be asleep, the girls hid under the blankets with flashlights to read. Shortly after they were settled in their new home, Barbara befriended a white girl who lived across the road. The girl's parents though forbade the daughter to associate with nine whites so the two girls hid their friendship, speak, sneaking off to play in the woods. By the time Barbara was in high school, the White family had moved away. As Barbara became a teenager, she took to spending time alone in the woods in her place near the creek where she meditated and looked inward, as she later explained. I roamed throughout the woods, wrapping myself in its quiet embraces listening only to the sounds of the birds, the scattering of the squirrels, rabbits, and other small creatures underfoot. Occasionally, a startled deer would leap hurriedly away, or a brace of quail would take flight, or some other small creature would scurry about, but mostly it was quiet and peaceful. The time has come. The morning after Barbara thought of the idea for a strike, she arrived at school eager to put her plan into action. She approached about a half a dozen class leaders. Among these were the twins, John and Carrie Stokes, and John Watson. Carrie was president of the 1951 graduating class. John Stokes was vice president, active on the debate team, and in New Farmers of America. John Watson was a member of the football team, editor-in-chief of the school newspaper, and a member of the Moton High Progressive Business Club. She told this select group her idea and arranged a meeting time and place. They held their initial meeting in October 1950 on cinder block bleachers facing the athletic field. Barbara pointed out to the group that their parents and teachers had made almost no progress in replacing their temporary classrooms. She said it was time for students to take the lead. The others agreed. They too were tired of attending school in tar paper shacks. The group decided that the best time to strike would be late in the spring to create an urgent situation. With students on strike, there could be no finals or graduation. Until then, the group would attend school board meetings and closely monitor any developments. In a few months, they would meet again to assess if there had been any progress on a new high school. At the February 1951 school board meeting, the members of the school board told the Moton High PTA that the Farmville Board of Supervisors had been given permission to purchase a site for a new high school for black students. The members of the school board, all of them white, also told the Moton High students, parents, and teachers not to bother coming to future meetings. They would be informed of any new developments. As of April, nothing had changed. There was no sign of a new building in the works. The students were ready to go on strike. And at the bottom, I believe this is a picture maybe of the land that they said they had purchased. The group handpicked other leaders to join them, bringing in students who lived in different areas and who were in different age groups. So the strike would have a wide base of support. Eldwida Allen, the 8th grade representative, remembers sitting outside with Barbara near the athletic field. Barbara told me the plan, Edwilda said, and explained that everyone was going to do. Eldwida, Eldwida was taken by Barbara's idea, but found it hard to believe the plan would work and that everyone would follow her. We were taught to be obedient and respectful, and there she was, asking us to be disobedient. It was shocking. Complete secrecy was vital. Parents or teachers 
suspected of participating in or even tactically allowing the strike could lose their jobs. Or worse, Barbara kept the secret from her own parents. Her father, she felt, was too busy plowing and planting and harvesting to bother with her plan, which he would probably consider foolish. He would never give her permission to go on strike, and he wouldn't be able to stop her. So why bother telling him? God, she felt, had given her the idea her task was to follow through. She kept the secret from her sister as well. Joan, meek and easily frightened, would be so scared by the idea she might be tempted to tell their parents. To get Principal Boyd Jones away from the school, the students decided someone should leave campus, call him, and tell him some of his students were making trouble downtown. They knew that the principal would believe this because it had happened before. After one such incident, he obtained a promise from the white business owners that if any of his students, and I'm going to adjust my seating here, that if any of his students made trouble in town during school hours, the business owners would call him instead of the police so he could take care of it. Barbara told John Watson he should be the one to make the call. His family, after all, was one of the few black families with a telephone. Moreover, nobody would be able to eavesdrop because his family had a private phone instead of a shared or party phone. So if you don't know what that is, a party phone, um, many years ago, long time ago, when I was a little girl, um, there was a phone in the house and it was called a party line. And a lot of people that lived around you had the same phone line. So if you picked up the phone in your house, somebody two houses down may be on the phone and you could hear their conversation um, and vice versa. They could hear yours. So you couldn't call anyone until they got off the phone. So ask your parents if, if they remember anything about that. Moreover, nobody would be able to eavesdrop because his family had a private phone instead of a shared or party phone. Also, the Watsons lived on Hill Street, one of three possible routes Principal Jones would take downtown, and someone had to be stationed along each route to watch and make sure the principal swallowed the bait and left the school. John Watson didn't want to be the one to make the call. He felt he had a distinctive voice and didn't think he could impersonate an older white man. Barbara encouraged him, suggesting he put a handkerchief over the phone's mouthpiece. They selected the day and time for the strike, 11 o'clock, the usual time for assemblies on Monday, April 23rd, 1951. Whenever Principal Jones called an assembly, he would write notes signed with his initial J. The notes went onto clipboards and certain girls hand delivered them to teachers. In preparation for the strike, Barbara wrote similar notes and signed them with a J. The task of taking the notes to the classrooms was given to the girls who ordinarily delivered them. At the appointed time, John Watson and a few others left the school and positioned themselves in various places to watch for the principal. Just before 11 a.m., John Watson telephoned the principal's office, disguising his voice, convinced Principal Jones that some of his students were causing trouble downtown. Principal Jones predictably left in a hurry. The moment he was gone, the students swung into action, the girls delivered the notes, and Barbara waited on the stage in the auditorium behind the curtain. The main school building was built in wings leading from the auditorium. To get them from one classroom to another, or from the library to a classroom, or from the principal's office to anywhere else, you had to pass through the auditorium. Soon came the pounding of feet and scraping of chairs as 450 students and their teachers flocked to the auditorium and sat in folding metal chairs. When the purple and gold curtain went up and the assembled students saw Barbara at the podium instead of Principal Johns, Jones, there was surprise and hubbub. Jones, sitting in the front row, was shocked. Knowing something highly irregular was happening, she cowered and hunched down in her chair. And there's a picture of the auditorium and the metal chairs. Barbara announced that the assembly was for students only, so she'd be obliged if the teachers would please leave. A few teachers left willingly, others had to be persuaded to leave. Barbara gave a speech that students later described as electrifying and inspiring. 
She talked about the appalling conditions at their school and the inability of the PTA and others to secure better facilities. She said the students had the right to equal facilities and it was clear that nothing ha would happen unless the students banded together and took action. Later, Barbara couldn't recall her exact words, but one classmate remembered her saying, are we going to just accept these conditions or are we going to do something about it? Before Barbara delivered this speech, many of her classmates who saw her as reserved and something of a loner hardly knew who she was. Her riveting speech. Sorry, I lost my plates for a second. Her riveting speech, therefore, took many by surprise. After that speech, one student reflected later. Everyone knew who she was. She put into words what needed to be said, recalled another student. I was glad someone had the courage to stand up and say it. Unbeknownst to those in the auditorium at the start of the assembly, one student left school and ran toward town, shouting that a riot had broken out. The rumor of a riot quickly spread. Among the first to hear the rumor was John and Carrie Stokes' mother, who startled her children by appearing in the auditorium doorway and demanding to know what was going on. Seeing that the assembly was orderly, however, she left. Before long, Principal Jones, having figured out that he'd been sent on a wild goose chase, rushed into the auditorium. Seeing what was afoot, he urged the students to return to class. He told them this sort of action would not solve their problems. He said progress was being made with the school board and they must be patient. The students began talking at once, shouting questions at Barbara, demanding to know how her plan would work. To maintain order, Barbara took off a shoe and hit the podium with it for attention. When she got silent, she explained why a strike was necessary and assured her classmates that nobody would be punished if they all stuck together. The jail isn't big enough for all of us, she said. She gave instructions. Everyone was to follow her out of the building. They must remain on school grounds. They could carry handmade signs and march in an orderly manner in front of the school, or they could sit inside quietly at their desk. But they were not to open their books or engage in the lessons. Others were fearful, but Barbara was not. She walked out of the school building, and all the students followed her. All right, so we're about halfway through the story, and we are going to take a break here, and then we're going to come back and see what happens. So think about it. What do you think is going to happen uh, when these students go on strike? Is Barbara going to be able to solve this problem? Tune in to the next segment, and we will see.